hide a lot of things by finding, for whatever reason, he, he found some Tachi Indians over on, that had moved over to the east side that were over 100 years old, and that they told what it was like to live in this area, and then they also told uh, from the previous chiefs what they had heard. So they were able to get information back for more than 150 years, almost 200 years, on things that happened here. But the stuff's only recorded in a, in a few places, and it's very, it's very hard to go back and, and find it now. But, but when I first started doing this, this research, uh, I came across it back when I was 13 or 14 years old. The library had, had, had this book about oil, the oil in the area, and I wanted to read it. But two chapters in here are about the local Indians, because when he got to the area where, where they were drilling oil, there, there was Indian artifacts and stuff there. So he, he did some talking to it. So, so, and, and they always tell you, a man is not a prophet in his own backyard. So I don't want somebody saying, well, Gordon Oakley said this. So I'm going to read to you some of the stuff out of the book so you know where I got it and where it came from. And uh, uh, this here is by uh, Frank Lotta. And Frank Lotta, um, he wrote a lot of different books, but he, he was, um, I don't want to compare him to Bill Howell. That wouldn't be fair. <laughs> um, he was a newspaper reporter for the paper in Tulare. And so he would go out and research and do this stuff and then write these, I call long articles, where he, you know, each week you get another segment of the article in, in the papers. So a lot of the stuff that he did later was he compiled all of his newspaper articles and put them, put them into books. And, and finding them. This book was a reference book at the, at the Klinga District Library. So back when I was 13 years old, I had to go in there with pen and paper. And my parents asked, where were you gone so long at? Because I wrote everything down by hand that was in there about those. And then, then years later, so I, so I spent, paid a fortune for this out of the, out of the antique bookstore in Clovis years ago. I, I found a copy and I paid extra because it had the, what they call the dust jacket on it and had the plastic cover on it. The, um, one of the other reasons, the other things, and I was telling Nancy, if you go online and you look stuff up, it's, it's true what they say. Don't believe everything you read online. <laughs> I was looking for specific stuff, but I came across an article about Joaquin Murrieta. So I read it. Oh, I didn't know that Joaquin Murrieta and his men all went to Whiskey Row and got drunk on Friday and Saturday <laughs> nights here in Kalinga, and that his, he married his wife, Mariana, and they called her La Loco, only in Kalinga, because she was a prostitute from Whiskey Row, and they got married and lived up Los Gatos Canyon, and I go, he was killed in 1853. <laughs> Who knows, other than Ed Cranhagen, what was here in 1853? <laughs> To be fair, he only heard it from, from relatives in the past, he, you know, but there was no whiskey roll, there was no Klinga in 1853. M.L. Curtis hadn't even come here and done his homestead over where Cedar Street is at yet. That, that, that hadn't even happened yet. So how he made it to Whiskey Row, and then you find his men all, all drunk laying alongside Los Gatos Canyon Road. And I read this and go, this is by a professor in New Mexico? Boy, uh, he did a lot of great research. And, but I, I printed it out to give, give to Nancy to see if she would believe it or not. And, uh, but that, but the, so the facts don't check out. So a lot of the things that Kruber and Lotta did is they would find things, but instead of making the findings match the story they wanted to tell, they went and, and found, like I say, the, the Native Americans, the Indians who lived in this area and asked them. There's other things that are written that, that I don't, don't totally, totally understand, uh, how they can make these comments of, about what they, because they're saying there's a lot of things they don't know here. The number three reason, and Roger's going to go into that with his part of the presentation. And, and, and I went to school here in Kalanga. I know Roger did too, but so I went to public school, and I'm old, so I'm doing this old school. You know, he's going to use the technology stuff. I did all that with the state. I, I'm trying to be retired, not, not do this. So Uncut and Wynes are very, very important people in the Tachi beliefs and culture. And Uncut. Here is the name, Tachi name, for gopher. The gopher. 
Oh, I thought that was him coming in the door. Okay, Umka, the golfer. Why Ness? Who's Why Ness? Who Why Ness is? And when I do stuff, it's interactive. So if you do all you spin, Why Ness is their equivalent of Adam. He's the first man that, that they ever knew. And he is the key that held fire. He's the only person that had fire. And he lived here in the Kalinga area. And from the other side of the valley, where the what they used to call the Santa Rosa Rancheria is at, and Orm Porterville, they could see over on this side of the valley there was fire. So the Indians on that group, and they believe a lot in the in the, the mythical parts of, of the, the, the animals. They sent the rattle, the gopher snake over here, they sent the eagle and everybody else to steal this fire from Wynette's, but he was always sharp and caught him. So finally, they they even they tried the gopher snake. They tried everything to get there. They couldn't do it. But their belief is that Uncut, the gopher, said, "Well, give me a try." So he went, and all the animals went, and they went to Wynette's, and he hid in the back behind them. So like sitting behind Bill Morris, there's Uncut, the gopher, and he dug underneath and came up here while I'm guarding the fire, and he got some of the fire and put it in his cheeks, and then dug a hole. And Wyness hadn't seen him yet till after he saw he was leaving in this hole and dug a hole all the way under Tulare Lake and took fire back to all the Apaches on the other side. And that's and that's their belief that Wyness, but they came to the to and the Indians at the time they interviewed knew that it was Klinga area, but it's before Klinga. But they came out here to the Indian camps at Klinga because that's where Wyness kept the fire. And that was the only place they could get fire in all the San Joaquin Valley. So that, that was one of, of, of the very important things of what they did in Klinga. There's also another one uh, that the prairie uh, falcon and the crow, they talk about the Indians like to gamble. They had come up with their own gambling games, and they had a game that was real similar to golf that they hit these. Well, they believe that game originated here. They'd start over on the valley, they would come across, and they would bet on whether the the raven or the crow was going to come back first. So you would hit this ball and keep hitting this ball. And they came all the way to the hills, two hills south of Kalinga, two of the lower hills, and that was the goal. You had to go around that and then go back to, to the country. So Kalinga was well known to them. And it's been discovered that Kalinga, uh, the Indian camps around here, were very, very old. These, these aren't places that were just a, just a couple hundred years ago. These places are real old, very, very old. And, and the, the naming in place, here's, some of the, here's one of the interviews that they did with, the, with one of the Indians. Um, he, he told of having visited the Asphaltum seepage near Klinga when he was a child of not more than seven years. At that time, about 1830, his people carried away many pounds of asphaltum. About 1890, while returning from Pozo Chenay with a sheep shearing crew, he visited Kalinga again to the asphalt and seepages, and he saw white men digging in the pits at the same site where the Indians had gathered asphalt for a long time. So what did they do with the asphalt? They made balls. They made balls? Yeah, they made little round balls. They made little round balls. What did they do with the asphalt? They waterproofed the arrow shafts heads. Yes. So they, they tied the, the, the arrow heads on like the other Indians onto the shafts with sinew, and then they sealed them with asphaltum so they wouldn't come back apart. So they they used it kind of like a, a, a additional glue, but it sealed them and kept everything there and, and kept kept the, the the sinew and stuff together. What else they do with them? Their baskets. Waterproof baskets. Thank you, Joe. They waterproof their baskets. They could carry their, their water in their baskets by lining them with asphaltum. This stuff, oh, I can't even think of the Seals commercial on TV. This was the original, yeah, this was the original flex paste, yeah. okay? <laughs> I can fix anything with it. They could, see, they could seal their bolts with it, and they, and they could do a lot of things with it. But they also use it, a lot of the mortars and things that are out here were made of sandstone. When you get up in the mountains, they're in granite and other But they were in sandstone here, and they would get broken. The tops would wear it out. They would build it back up with asphaltum. They would glue it back together with the Indian flex tape, put it back together. And in this book, they have pictures of that where they have 
Go ahead. Well, they'd also adhere uh, a webbing or a basket on top of the mortar to cross. Yeah. To expand the volume. Yep. Yeah. Why aren't you up here doing this? Well, I used to have one of those, but I can't find it anymore. But they make me drive 180 miles to do this. Okay. I'll help out when I can. Okay. okay. You're doing fine. You're doing fine. And that's what I want to know. If you, if you got some, the information is all over the place. So I hope that some people are here, not, not for me to come entertain you, but to maybe spark that interest. Nothing's collected together information in one spot. It's here, there, it's everywhere, and it's not well documented. The Spaniards came through this area. What year was it? Who's the school teacher? Bill. Where's Bill? Yeah. What year did the Spaniards walk through this, walk through this area and walk up through the valley? It, it wasn't until 1805. Well, they were here before that. They were here before that, but the, they only documented that Moraga was here in 1805. And now they're saying, well, no Spaniards came to this area. Really? Now, Mr. Crang knows. Hakalitas Canyon, Hakalitas Creek. You go up the canyon, you could you ride our bicycles up Burma Road. If you came down the other side, you, were, you took your life in your own hands because in Cranhagen would be out there. Going, what are you doing on my property? <laughs> so you're at the Hakalitas Ranch, the Hakalitas area. What does Hakalitas mean? This one. Little huts. Little huts. It's a Mexican Spanish uh, derivation, of course, but it means little huts. There were so many little huts that they could see as they're walking through <coughs> up Hakalitas Canyon. I, and then when I was in school, there were two, two brothers that said they used to go up there, and that place was full of Indian arrowheads and other things that they used to find just following the creek up Hakalitas Canyon. So, you will not read about that on the internet or in any book anywhere. <clears throat> For these guys coming over here when they're doing their research, they never went a pack of leaves. And they say, even though it's named Little Huts, we think that was a name given to it later by the surveyors, not by the Spaniards. Well, it's not true. Well, then why didn't they go look at the area? They knew it was still little huts and the surveyors were there. <clears throat> Nobody ever came in and explored that area and documented it. So where did the Tachis start from and where did they end up at? Where, what was their land? It's very, very, very hard to tell. Uh, let's see here. So here on this map, here was Tulare Lake. And of course, Tulare Lake was a lot bigger than it is today <laughs> because Tulare Lake, my uh, grandfather-in-law is one of the guys who ran the caterpillars down there when they, uh, down through Corcoran, when they drained Tulare Lake to turn it into farmland. Um, so Tulare Lake in 1907, this was the size of it. All this hashed area out here, that's how far out the marsh area went. So there was marshland and tools, tools, little tools. And so people in LA talk about, oh, you live up in the valley up there? Oh, you live up where the tule fog is at. Yeah. Well, it used to be tule fog. Now there's not much fog because there's not much rain. But the people live here. So I don't know if you can see over here. Here's 11 and here's 12. 11 is Golan. You ever heard of Golan? Okay, let me let me change the pronunciation. Huron. <laughs> Golan is what is Huron. Did anybody ever tell you that Huron had an Indian village there? I know from driving the Amnesty out there in the 70s, there were a lot of wild Indians out there on Friday and Saturday night. <laughs> but they, they weren't there. Number 10. Ujiwi. Ujiwi. Where's Uji where's Ujiwi? Real close. They refer to it as it's in the valley east of Kalinga, six miles. This Pozo is what we know as Pozo Chenet. A lot of originally figure, and so you'll see the name Pozo Chenet, <laughs> and it's spelt different ways C H A N A, C H A N E T, C H I N E. It, it, it's not C H I N E. Anywhere on a map or any place that's C H I N E, 
that was short. You see it on old maps of town, C-H-I-N-E, laundry. It wasn't Indian laundry, it was a Chinese laundry. So, so it was not Chinese Creek. <clears throat> and you'll see people call it Pozo de Chenet, Pozo Chenet. So they assumed, Bob assumed that Chenet was the name of the Indians that lived in this area because he felt it was too far for the Tachi Indians. Until he interviewed these other people that knew, oh no, the Tachis were here, this is where fire was, came from, the other items. Well, Chenet was the name of the chief who was at So it wasn't, so they call it, it's, it definition means chain pool. What would this chain pool? It'd be the same as Gordon Pool. And that's why it's Pozo de Chenet. It was the pool of Chenet. But he was just the Indian chief at the time. In the 18, uh, uh, by 1810 to 1830, they were all rounded up by Spaniards and they were taken to Mission San Miguel. So they didn't live there anymore. The Hispanics that came and the Higuera family that came in called it Pozo Chenet. There, there's a, a picture, there was a float that the city of Kalinga had in the parade going down 5th Street for, for Derby Day. <coughs> I don't even know what year it is. It looks like the 60s. And it said, City of Klinga, Pozo de Chenet, 1843 to 1853. I don't even know where they got those dates from. Uh, the Pozo Chenet was, was a stop on the El Camino Viejo. It was a watering hole. So, so after the Indians were gone, and they escaped once and came back, and 1830, they were picked and taken back up to San Miguel. It was a watering stop on El Camino Viejo. There was not just a pool there, and a the reason why it was uh, so famous, there was also a Cienega there. And a Cienega, not down in LA, La Cienega, it's, it's a marshy swamp area. The water bubbled up, came out of the area, there were trees that grew there, vines and everything. So then when the Higuera family came there, and after the Indians had left, it was used as a meeting place where the wild mustangs were rounded up from the mountains and brought down to that area. Then they were taken up to the Bay Area to be sold and taken down El Camino Viejo that went all the way down to Ventura, to Oai, and took them down there to, for sale. So what they call the Mesoneros, Mesoneros uh, ran that. Mesoneros. Mustanios. Mustanios. Well, there you go. Uh, you, you can. That's why I cut my hair. Long hair can't hide a redneck. Okay. <laughs> Mustanios. Okay. Yeah. And so they they ran the horses back and forth. They brought them from all sides. They brought them there. Some from the south were brought up, and it was a horse trading place. Well, they all left, and and Cranhagen came and took it over. And what did the Cranhagen family run there originally? Sheep. No. Sheep. sheep. Yep. They had sheep and livestock. Well, they took it over. And I, I actually have uh, copies of the directory for Pozo Chenet when there's about 20 different families that, that lived out there. Um, I don't remember which the, but uh, the, the different Crane Hagens, and then one of the Crane Hagens moved and went to Paul Videro. Because Paul Videro was another watering hole. So he ran sheep there. It's the same time they owned the, the uh, Fresno Hot Springs, Clint, what we know as Klinga Mineral Springs, also known as Rogers Springs. So the families moved around. Okay, so what Indian tribe, this is Nancy's question, lived up Los Gatos Canyon? Uh, Yoka? Yoka? What do you think, Roger? What we've seen is we suspect different tribes came in and out. Okay, there were a few in the creek, and a lot of it was a hunting area. Nobody went up that way. The Indians did. A lot of evidence of that. The reason you can find some things, some of the things that are find in history on this stuff, with the current environmental impact reports, we've all heard about it. You need an EIR study. The state and local governments have done a lot of research to identify these sites and get the names of these places down so when you build, they can designate whether you can build or what you have to do to relocate it. 
When they found Poe's Ocean Age, the railroad came through and went right through the upper part of Poe's Ocean Age. But they just, so in 1887, when they're laying the tracks from here on, they came through and just touched the surface, put the ballast, put the ties down, laid the track. Didn't really disturb it. But then when Phelps was run along, the, the, following the dirt road that went out to the farms, and they dug right up around where Crane Higgins had their belt, where the road cuts around like this, they cut into the hillside. And that's where they found Indian burial site. And the Indian burial site, from that point on, and I'm just gonna tell you, was desecrated and pillaged by almost everybody here in town going out there looking <coughs> for items. And and the, part of the skeletons and the skulls that were there were brought in here to the museum. And they were put in the back cabinet by the back, by that back door leading out the side there. And they were in that cabinet for, for years and years until one day Indian tribes came over and said, why are you displaying our ancestors in the cabinet? Like this, you gotta do something with them. They were taken out at that time. They called my dad, he was the foreman at the cemetery. I was, my dad said, you gotta come with me. You're the, you're the guy in Boy Scouts that does all the Indian stuff. And we took them, and we took them out, and we reburied them. And we buried them in a plot, place where they can't be disturbed again. And so only my, only my dad and I were there. We didn't take anybody else with us, and my dad's gone. So, so I'm the only one that knows where they're at. We buried them actually at the cemetery. But they're not in a marked grave. They're not in a spot where they'll be dug up. They're, they're real close to the creek. So they're within a mile. Well, they're within the areas they roamed at before, but they're within a mile from where they were, where, where they were dug up before. And so today I was told there are people. So back here in the cabinets, you'll see stuff by Gordon Kane. He, he highly excavated that area and sifted through all that stuff and then had his own collection of stuff and stuff that was donated to the, donated to the museum. You'll also see stuff back in the cab, in a cabinet back there, this full headdress and regalia. From, says it was from Harless Danny. So who knows who Harless Danny was? Yeah, remember Harless Danny? Harless Danny was a fire chief. He was a great man. He was a fire chief. <laughs> but but uh, he, he, he died early on in the 50s. He wasn't that old. But part of his hobby was he was into theatrical and he was into entertainment. And so once the high school auditorium was built on Saturdays, he would go to there and uh, we had a whole troop of people that went and they put on shows there. Well, the shows that, that they put on, then he met these <coughs> Indians over on what they called at that time, it wasn't Tachi Palace, it was the Santa Rosa Rancheria. And they, they formed a common bond. And it was sealed over many bottles of liquor. <laughs> and that's kind of why he died early. He had the equipment, he had a relative relation to uh, cirrhosis of the liver. He, um, Roy Hamilton used to live with him for a while. He says he, he drank all, all the time. And so the stuff that's back there, I told him, that's all Plains Indian stuff. That is not California Indian stuff. Well, there's a book a lady published in 1970, like 1977. And on the front cover, there's a picture of Tachi Indian Sandstrom, and they're wearing that, that stuff. He went to Bannerman's catalog and he ordered all that stuff for him to put, to put, 